Well, uh, it's great to, to be here today with Benjamin, uh, Benjamin Forster Baldenius. I think it's, uh, you could say that you're part of so many important things that have changed the way uh, the world thinks architecturally. I, I'm, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this. So it's a very important uh, occasion and actually I'm very glad that we're having this discussion here today. Uh, I, I believe that uh, the work that Benjamin Stone uh, himself, but always or most times together with others uh, and as part of collectives, uh, like the Round Labor, of course, collective, or, uh, or even the beyond the Round Labor, the, the floating university that brought together so many people, it's been uh, not only uh, been incredibly influential, but then actually opening possibilities to think architectural practices, architecture, urbanity, beyond the hegemonies of uh, capitalism or extreme capitalism, globalization, and other forms of domains. And, and I think that that is something that needs to be acknowledged uh, because the possibility of think beyond these hegemonies is something that is often denied. And the fact that there's an evidence, a, a number of, a big body of work of evidences that, uh, that uh, claim the possibility for alternative is something that is crucial in a moment of def a huge defiance like the ones that we're uh, facing now uh, and beyond and before as well and probably after. Uh, Benji Benjamin's work has shown that it's possible to work beyond the frame of powers, markets, ideologies that present themselves as uh, natural and, and uh, excluding of alternative. And I think that uh, that is something that comes also as a form of architectural mobilization. And I think that that's also important, that this is not something that operates, let's say, as a side practice, but is growing from the very specificity of how architecture operates socially, ecologically, materially, technologically, as a process that, that mobilizes all those means and that uh, it can be operating differently to perform a different po political program. In 1997, Benjamin uh, founded the Institute for Applied Architecture, and three years later, he joined Round Labor. Round Labor defines itself as a network, a collective of architects who come together in a co collaborative structure to work at the intersection of architecture, city planning, art, and urban intervention. They address city and urban renewal as a process attracted to difficult urban locations places uh, torn uh, between different systems, time periods and planning ideologies that cannot adapt are the sites where they operate, places that are abandoned, left over, or in transition that contain some relevance for the processes of urban transformation. These places are their experiment experimentation site where untapped potentials can be activated through other forms of architectural uh, engagement. I still remember the first time I, I was uh, close, or I, I, I was part, or in a way I witnessed uh, around Labor's work in Hotel Neustadt, in Halle Neustadt, that I visited in 2003. And actually I was shocked by the way architecture could operate beyond the divisions of form and program, or architects and users, and basically all those categories were thrown uh, off to reinvent a world where entanglement was actually operated as a site for activism. Uh, Kion Park defined the hotel stat, uh, or the, this hotel noise stat, as the hotel stat directly developed into self-regulating informal urban strategies generated through participation of a cooperation between artists and populace, outsiders and locals, top-down and bottom-up movements, just like a high-rise favela uh, Hotel Neustadt was a city without a master plan, a new city within fa a fading context, a temporary city within permanence, uh, a nomadic city within a settlement. Their influence, uh, Round Labor's influence, and Benjamin's work in many other networks has been huge. Uh, here in New York in 2009, they launched the Space Buster, or they presented this, the, or they used for the first time, with, together with others, the Space Buster, uh, with a storefront for art and architecture. And that kept running for many years and many iterations until now. You were telling me that the car was falling apart, right? And it was somehow <laughs> diluted uh, into other material uh, networks. 
uh, and many other works that together constitute a stubborn, I would say, commitment to enact architecture as a political practice. Uh, in 2018, the Floating University was founded uh, with Benjamin, of course, uh, as a kind of uh, a big part of its foundation. It was conceive, uh, conceived as an intervention in the rainwater retention basin serving the Tempelhof air, air, air field in Berlin. Uh, it was uh, from then uh, an opportunity to, to rethink the way architecture was conceived as a process, uh, where basically acting was uh, indivisible from designing, thinking, from doing, those doing were also users. Knowledge produced in this university was intrinsically connected to its materiality and the evolution of its materiality. Uh, no material was coming there without the history and was living there without already a more complex history. The experience there was, I would say, one of the most intense architectural experiments that has been happening in the last decades. And that was also open to participation of many different institutions, many different people, many actually people here was part of that to a certain extent. Uh, and there were projects that were added to it and happened through and as part of the floating university as a way to claim architecture as a permanent experiment with a social and ecological uh, intensity that is often impossible to, 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 to witness in, in uh, a conventional architecture. Uh, I wanted also to say that, of course, we could go in a very uh, classic way to go through all the merits and distinctions uh, that Benjamin himself uh, uh, accumulates, I would say, and that would be endless, but I would say that, of course, the recognition that uh, Raoul Labor got in the, in the past Venice Biennial uh, with the Golden Lion was, of course, unanimously received uh, by the community of architecture around the world as something that was fully deserved. And that was also uh, pointing to new directions for architecture to operate, and that adds to many, many other awards. Benjamin is also uh, uh, a professor. He's a professor of cohabitation defined by the uh, institution as uh, the, the uh, Stadel Schule in Frankfurt and Main as the art of living together on a damaged planet, right? I guess that, that there was a lot of thinking and discussion probably put in the, the definition of your position as professor of co 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 cohabitation, right? And of course, uh, before has, uh, there's a long list of places where Benjamin has taught, like the Prague Academy for Art, Architecture and Design, the, the Folkwang University uh, of the Arts in Essen, the Royal Academy of Arts in uh, Danag, and many, many other places. Uh, so I, I think that uh, we're here uh, in a very, this is a very special moment. Uh, I think we, we have the great opportunity tonight to discuss architecture from a different, very different perspective, but the perspective that is totally needed and responding to contemporary defiance probably much more intensively than many, any other uh, practice and body of work that I can recall. And I want to, to, uh, to include in this introduction the words of Raoul Labor defining themselves and, and, and Benjamin as a fundamental part of it. We call what we do research-based design. We're committed to dealing with placers one-to-one, -one, discovering and using what we find within the conditions of the site in the process of doing. We learn more through active design about the site of investigation and find new methods that are open to appropriation and upgrades the existing. Uh, we do not solve problems. That resounds probably with many of the discussions that happened here and have happened here in the last decades. Rather, we initiate processes that give actors the opportunity to know, understand, and use the city and its dynamics as well as its possibilities. Please welcome me to, uh, join me to welcome Benjamin here tonight. Hi, I, I, Andres. Thanks a lot. That was strong words. I'm not sure if they weren't a bit too strong, but uh, let's see. So yeah, thank you very much. It finally worked. I'm here. I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad you are here, uh, even though there's a storm out there, uh, even though uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very important uh, and special day for the world. Uh, 
the funeral of uh, Queen Elizabeth has already happened, but uh, I can understand that maybe this is the time when people want to sit and watch it, uh, because it's still going on. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you, are, you, know, you, you decided to see that later on YouTube or on the news uh, and rather come here. Um, and uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, I can see or not see. Also, where's the camera? Because there's somewhere. Ah, there. Uh, because I understand that there's also people out there uh, in the digital desert uh, watching this lecture. Um, sorry, I, we can't communicate. But, uh, but I hope you enjoy it as well. Especially, and I have to say that because I know now that my friends Dusty and John are sitting in a trailer somewhere in an Indian reservation in Arizona uh, watching this. So. Um, yeah, so this, this event today, it, it leaves many people very, very sad. But it, um, it also asks a lot of questions. Um, a lot of questions that, um, that are uh, around the role of the commonwealth. And maybe we should, maybe it's a good day to rethink this term. What is commonwealth? And uh, how should we deal with it? And um, maybe it's also a good day to think about democracy and the role of democracy and the way it's structured. And as I read yesterday on a bench, at the river, it's a good day to be alive and not dead. OK, um, so let's get started. Um, my name is Benjamin. I think that was said already. I am uh, a trained architect, and, um, but I see myself more as a performing architect. So I'm exactly in my role today. I'm performing uh, the work with we've done. And uh, this is actually not the image that I wanted to show. I wanted to show this image. Um, this is the book that me and my colleagues from Raumlabor, we are nine architects, by the way, have published in 2008. That is the last book we have published. And in 2014, I received an email from the University of Vilnius in uh, Lithuania that um, sent me a file that was a transcript of a lecture that my friend and colleague Matthias had uh, given at that school two years earlier. Now, that lecture was on the 2nd of February. Um, and. Uh, and later in May, he passed away. That, it was a strange thing to receive uh, this, this kind of transcript, uh, like, a, like a voice from, from the past somehow. And um, I just want to read to you the beginning of the lecture, which is really interesting, because it's also the first words on the book that we are publishing soon. Here it goes. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be in Vilnius. It is the first time in my life, and it is also the first time in my life that I have experienced minus 30 degrees today. In Berlin, we have minus 16 at the moment. So let's start. Before I forget, I have to introduce our own book. It's called Acting in Public, and we published it in 2008. This was our first book. And in it, we collected our first works. And it is also a little bit about the background where we are coming from, why we are working, and how we are working. And the things I will show today are mostly not in this book. So it will be a surprise for you if you have read this book. There will be something new. At the moment, we are thinking about a new book because 
we've had a lot of new experiences with our work. That's 10 years ago, and we still haven't published the new book. But um, since three years we're working on it, again, we've taken it up again. But Matthias was kind of the, the main brain behind publishing that book, so we had to stop at some point, and we tried again. It, it, it always, we always had the problem that we didn't know how to, um, how to deal with the archive of our projects, because there are so many projects that, um, that we are doing that are going to different directions that we couldn't find an order uh, that we would agree on in a book. So there is an order, for example, on our website that works quite well with you know, all the links and so on. Uh, but in a book, it's from the beginning to the end. And, um, and then uh, three years ago, a friend of mine, Hermann Ferker, came to me and he said, Benny, I've just finished the book about my work. It was so much fun. Maybe um, I, and then I thought, I want to make a book about Berlin. And then I thought, actually, it's better to make a book about you, uh, Raumlabor. Um, because it's also telling the story of Berlin somehow. And I said, okay, let's try. We've tried before, but... <laughs> and then, um, then we started. And the, the question of the order somehow remained. And I have something to read to you from a very... Um, no, it's on page 66. My favorite writer, Georges Perec. And in this book, brief notes on the art and manner of arranging one's book. He has this article that has exactly that name. And under 2.1, he says, and that's interesting because we're sitting under the library, right? I, I, I figured out when I was out there, that the library is just up there. We're in the basement for the ones who, don't, who are not here. Ways of arranging books ordered alphabetically, ordered by continent or country, ordered by color, ordered by date of acquisition, ordered by date of publication, ordered by format, ordered by genre, ordered by major period of literary history, ordered by language, ordered by priority for future reading, ordered by binding, ordered by series, I think it could go on, you know, ordered by color, ordered by size, ordered by um, the books I have read, the books I haven't read, the books I want to read, the books I have read half. Um, so there's many ways to order things. Um, that's also why it's so difficult to agree. But then we decided that we should not order put order into our projects, but more talk about the topics that we are interested in. So what we, what we did for the new book that is called Polylemma is that we've um, met lots of friends and colleagues and cooperators, and we talked together um, about the topics that we are interested in. And then with a system that we don't reveal, we show images of our projects. And this is also what I will do with you today. Um, but I'm not going to read, of course, I'm not going to read the text from the book, but I'm going to show you the projects and explain, you know, give you a bit the sub, subtitles of the projects. Now, as we are on this uh, important day for democracy, um, I have um, decided that I don't decide what I talk about, but that we decide on it together. Um, and what you see here is different kind of small slideshows. You can see how long they are by looking at the amount of megabytes that they have. Um, and these are topics. Uh, and, I, and in a minute, I will tell you what's 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 behind that. Um, uh, so you have an idea and, and a way to decide. And then with a, something like an applausometer, uh, we will decide what I talk about. Uh, there's one exception. 
Um, as Andres has invited me, I gave him the first choice. Uh, so he is a kind of the monarch uh, on the side. <laughs> uh, and uh, as you could imagine, he wants me to talk about the floating university. So we have to have a little bit of time in the end to, talk, uh, to, to, to hear uh, the story behind the floating university, which also makes sense because lots of these topics kind of, you know, kind of lead into, uh, stream into the floating university. So wait a minute, there's a thing here. Building the city together um, is mainly talking about uh, hands-on architecture, us going somewhere uh, with a, a, a car or a truck full of machines uh, and, uh, and, and a bit of an idea what the outcome should be, and then we get, try to gather through the building together uh, the neighborhood or the people around or groups of people, and we build things together, and by that kind of raise a bit of um, um, identification towards the outcome. Um, then transforming urban practice. Now well, that's a big topic for us, but I've, I've reduced it a bit to the story of uh, the Temple of Airfield, which is for Berlin a very, very important site because it's super big and it was given to the city as a kind of a present, a new public space that is maybe half as big as Central Park, and uh, has nothing on it. Uh, there is things on it, but no, you know, no, there, there's no kind of design features there yet. Um, and we've, we have made a couple of interventions there. Uh, we've been part of the planning of the opening of the site, and uh, I think it's an interesting story. So if you're into a story, that would be this. Then water culture. Now this is about, you know, to, what, I mean, there's many topics that we are super interested in um, and that we try to bring into our, in, into our work. And one of them, uh, or one of these things that is always coming back is uh, the sense of water and trying to design with water and bringing water into it. This um, is talking a bit about that and it ends with the swimming pool that we are building at the moment in Gothenburg. Um, then the mobile activator units. This is if you are interested in all these kind of um, uh, bubbles and cars and machines that we build to go into places and activate uh, them, like the Space Buster, obviously. Um, then I go down, the end of the fossil age. Oh, that, you can see that's a big topic, because, because it, it, it will be a big topic for all of us uh, very soon, or, or maybe the, you know, and the generations coming then. So um, there's many aspects kind of lead into our work um, uh, where we're dealing with that. Um, so that's many, many crazy projects. How to become a Raumlabor is, um, we can also leave that for later for the, you know, the Q&A, but it's, I, I didn't want to miss it because I, I know that it's also interesting. Once you've seen a couple of these projects, you're wondering, uh, how is this possible? How could you, you know, where, how, how, how did this happen that you are not sitting at, uh, in an office like Skidmore Owings or, or a smaller office making uh, ventilation planning for universities? Um, floating university, that's clear. Spaces of encounter, that's a, that's a nice one because it's, 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 it's one of these things that we always try to attempt is, um, as, as bringing different people together and making, making uh, uh, yeah, attracting people with architecture so that um, the, uh, the social dynamic that actually is the one that makes the space it's not the architect, it's not the builder, it's not the walls and ceilings. It's mostly people that are coming um, and doing things. Um, this is um, what this is about. Learnscapes is about kind of learning environments um, that we've been doing, like programs and 
workshops and um, different, you know, uh, our own universities that we are founding from time to time uh, that are vanishing again. Fast Hotels is the one that's including that. I didn't know that you were, <laughs> that you were at Hotel Neustadt. That's so long ago. It's 20 years ago. Uh, um, but uh, it's talking about uh, the notion of sleeping and how, um, how, how that can play a big role in, in, our, in our cultural life. Ambiguity tolerance, that's, I just have to have that word in every lecture because I like it so much. Um, it's, um, I think it's a skill that we, uh, that, that, that we all should be training, um, that, um, that we're bearing, you know, that things are being seen in different ways from different angles uh, with different perspectives, and then the outcome is also maybe different. Um, that's part of democracy, for sure, um, but it's also um, part of the world that we live in. Uh, this, uh, this one is mainly talking about the project that we did in St. Louis, Missouri um, uh, for the Pulitzer Foundation, because I think it bring, you know, it's, it's the most kind of crazy situation, maybe, that we've worked in. And then space democracy. Uh, this one I like very much. I can say that because it's the day of democracy today. Um, so how do we do this now? Um, maybe I need one person who can who has a better ear than me. Uh, and uh, you you have to decide which applause was the loudest. Who is that? You, do you want to do this? Yeah? OK, great. It's only because you're sitting in the front row. I could take somebody from the back row as well. Maybe two people. Maybe the guy in the back row. Yeah? The, yeah? You? Yeah? Uh, and you decide together which one was louder. So, um, OK. Moment to make up your mind. Hmm? I, th I would think that each one is about 10, 15 minutes. So, uh, and I've spent already so much time on the introduction. <laughs> but anyways, I hope you all brought some time so we can you know, spend, a, a sp spend a bit of time. So let's say we pick two of them for the moment, right? Reduce it to two. Okay, we start with building the city together. Okay. Transforming urban practice. Okay. Water culture. Mobile activator units. Well, okay. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an old shoe. I understand. Uh, the end of the fossil age. Hmm. Okay. How to become a Raumlabor? Mm hmm. We skip floating university. Spaces of encounter. I wonder when it comes. Learnscapes. Fast hotels. Mm. Okay. Ambiguity tolerance. Uh, okay. And space democracy. Come on. <laughs> okay, it's difficult to decide. Do you know? And the second? She says ambiguity tolerance. What are you saying? Huh? Ambiguity tolerance. Yeah, and the other one, the second one? No, I think Okay. So we start with ambiguity tolerance. Here we go. You can see I, I, I did a lot of work 
just to hold this lecture, just for you, just you know, to have a kind of a base of a democratic uh, decision taking. Okay, so ambiguity tolerance, I already said what I understand about it. They, um, you probably all know the, the Pulitzer Foundation building, um, and uh, it, we were invited in 2016, actually in 2015, we were invited to, um, to um, produce a work for them. Now the team of the Pulitzer is super cool, and they, were, they knew who they are inviting. So they, they, they weren't inviting somebody who was just going to put a nice artwork in the middle of the gallery, but they wanted a kind of, a, kind of social interaction. Uh, but of course, they also wanted something in the gallery, you know, not only out there. So they reserved the biggest gallery, uh, the one on the left. And, um, and then we had a very super simple idea. Um, <laughs> And uh, 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 it goes like that. Oh, no. Different. Other side. Okay. St. Louis is, um, is interesting for us because of different reasons. First of all, I was an exchange student in St. Louis. Um, so I was twice in St. Louis when I was 15, 16. Uh, and I remember it like faintly. Um, and, um, but all my colleagues haven't been there, so they didn't have the same reason to, to go there. But what we all know is the destruction of the Prudigo uh, buildings, because it's part of uh, the Koyanis Katsi movie. Uh, and because, um, because this uh, uh, is, um, that was a very iconic moment in, in, the, in the time of architecture. Uh, the Prut I Go settlement um, that was built by um, Yamazaki, I always forget his name, but uh, you probably all know him, um, because it's not the only building that got destroyed uh, that he designed. That, that must be a, a strange feeling in your career if you, you know, uh, one of them is declared as the and uh, of well, the day when modernism died, and the other one uh, created a mess for the next 100 years in the city. Um, but the idea was very much coming from, uh, from, from this uh, Bauhaus disciple, Hilbersheimer, who uh, at that time made this design for the city of Berlin. Um, that looked very much the same. But, um, and in Berlin, it was also at the same, almost at the same time with the, with the Prudigo settlement, we had a design that was, uh, that was realized that was already slightly different because Hilbersheimer's design was already 30 years old. So that, you know, there were other ideas of, uh, of uh, urban, urban design at that time. Uh, that was the uh, International Building Exhibition, built at the same, almost at the same, a little bit later, of course, than the Prudigo. Um, and, and the East Berlin reaction to that was the, um, the uh, at that time it was the Stalin Allee, now it's the Karl Marx Allee, um, buildings that were, um, that were kind of serving the same ground, but uh, in St. Louis, it was a bit of a different story because they didn't, you know, obviously in St. Louis there was no war before that destroyed the whole city like it was in Berlin. But um, there was this kind of housing that you see here in the front that was coming from this time when St. Louis was very dense and that had a certain history that led to the fact that the inner city houses or parts of the inner city houses were, um, were um, accommodating lots of not so wealthy people. So um, it was seen more or less as a slum. Um, and it needed something that should be done. Um, the, um, the reaction was that there was um, the, maybe a, a, one of the few times in the history of the American uh, urban planning. Uh, there was a big housing settlement built that was social housing. Now, because it was one of the first, there were a lot of 
decisions that were made wrongly. And that was, for sure, not the architecture, because the architecture is as neutral as the queen. Um, of course, it's not. But, um, but, the, uh, but there was a lot in the, in the rules and regulations, in the, in the way that, um, that uh, the, 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 the tenants of the houses were being chosen. It was only, there was still a kind of a, um, a, a, a racial segregation. So some of the buildings were for white people, others were for black people. Then in the houses of the black people, you could only, there could only be mothers uh, with kids but no husbands. So it had to be single mothers with kids. And of course, uh, there weren't enough single mothers with kids, so they kind of faked uh, the absence of the husband. Uh, and then, uh, and then uh, and at the moment that the buildings were built, um, the, there was a, a new law that segregation is not, um, uh, is not allowed anymore. So uh, th th all the apartments had to be given to all kinds of people, and that meant that more and more black people moved into the white corners, and then the white flight happened, and all the white people ran away and became a completely uh, colored neighborhood with uh, a lot of, um, uh, yeah, al already at that time, I think, a lot of social problems. And then there was no, then the political system changed, and there was no, uh, no, no money anymore for the maintenance, and then everything that broke got repaired. And, and, uh, and that led to situations where you had a winter where a lot of the pipes broke and nothing got repaired, and you had these like, long stalactites of ice hanging down. And that, again, was the argument that, um, that was not well taken care of also by the tenants, so it had to be torn down. And as uh, Charles Jenks said, that was the day that modernism died. And what he meant was that the ugly modern architecture has to die so he can build his postmodern architecture. But of course, it was not the fault of the architecture. And, uh, and that was the site when we came, uh, was still this wild forest. We have some areas in Berlin that were the, were the, same, uh, the same state. Uh, so it was, you know, nobody ever wanted to build there again. Um, the, um, at also, in the moment that we arrived, the whole plot got sold to the NGA, not NSA. Uh, so the, um, the National Geographic Agency, there's another image coming. And this is things I have to tell to other people, but you all know what St. Louis looks like, and you all know why it looks like the way it looks like. Um, you also all know that Ferguson is part of the St. Louis County, and, um, and that um, this, uh, this site is almost downtown. And what is happening now is this whole site, now, this is the prude I go site that we've seen before with the high rises, plus three times as much above there uh, is a big construction site for basically a server farm. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting because sometimes I, I look again what it looks like because you can still see it. I'm, I wonder why, when, it, when it vanishes from Google Earth. Now, the, this whole story is interesting, was interesting to us because we couldn't understand how a city is taking itself apart. Um, mainly, um, I mean, wh why? How can it be that a city in the center of the city has so many falling apart buildings, um, brown fields, uh, green fields, uh, and, uh, and, and so on? And then we made a big research about that. I mean, we have to. Maybe you don't have to because you already know it. But, but we as, for us as Europeans, it, it, it really is, is, is a strange uh, uh, phenomena going on there. Uh, what we see here is um, this is the Pulitzer Foundation. This image is actually to show that it's also built on the same plot uh, like uh, all the other, the, the other part of, uh, of, the, of the city. Um, 
and it's built by this guy. And the interesting thing is that when I looked at that, I was wondering what critical regionalism is because I'm not so good in architectural history. And I found out that critical regionalism is actually the opposite of postmodernism, which I thought was an interesting thing and also a good reason to, uh, to deal with these topics in this building because we thought that Tadawando would like it. Um, so um, the, wh why I'm showing this is because wh what is pretty clear is that as this building is made out of three normal uh, St. Louis uh, building lots, we would probably fit a house in there. And um, you can see it here as well. Now, this is, a, this is a, a, a research plan that we made after we were we have been explained that there was this law uh, of the red lining where the city of St. Louis at some point decided that there's parts of the city that they would um, maintain and where they would put effort into keeping the urban structure. And that is everything underneath the red line. The red line is a street called Delmar. Uh, and that everything above that line would be basically from an urbanistic point of view left to itself. And of course, you can guess who lived at that time on the lower part of the map and who lived on the upper part of the map and uh, what was going on there. Um, so, um, and what I think is also interesting that you can see on this map very well that the density here actually remained better than uh, density of this area. So, um, that it, we, what we have here is a severe case of racial discrimination, I think, in urban planning. And that's how, um, how neutral urban planning is or not. OK, so, um, so the, w what we wanted to find is a neighborhood that wants to get rid of a house. And we found uh, the Lewis Place neighborhood that is very well organized already. And, uh, and they, they, there was somebody to talk to. They, and, and, uh, and we went there several times and uh, had a lot of potluck dinners with the neighborhood association and uh, walked around the neighborhood and decided that um, uh, on a house that, uh, together that we would take. And that's here, the 4562 Enright Avenue. Um, which um, was exactly the size of a house that we needed. And, uh, and we decided to, um, uh, to, uh, to look at it and, and, and find out how we do this. Now, of course, uh, we, we, it was clear that, we, that it's a bit difficult to take the whole house. I mean, the budget of the Pulitzer was OK, but not OK enough to actually transport the whole house. So we decided that we take mostly their, um, the, the, everything but the bricks uh, and, uh, and everything but the stuff that was lying inside. Um, and that was uh, a story on itself. Anyways, so we, but I like the colors of that house somehow. Um, so we decided to take everything that's wood the floors, the windows, the doors, um, and uh, find ways to bring that uh, over. What we, what we, another thing that we found out um, by looking closely at this building, because the, the building, the Lewis Place neighborhood used to be um, uh, a neighborhood exclusively for white people. Um, and uh, when we looked into the, into the um, papers, um, the documents of this building, it was clear there was a moment when um, the house was bought by somebody and then three days later sold again to somebody else. And, uh, and it turned out that the, the somebody who bought the house was a white person who was de working as an agent for a black person uh, that, uh, that was wanted to buy this house. And the black person was, I think, a doctor or, um, or, yeah, or a teacher. Uh, the teacher came later. And, um, and what you can see here is uh, a, a, a strange effect, uh, a strange part of the planning. Uh, and um, 
and that is you have two staircases. One staircase is the staircase when you enter the house and you go up, and they, these are the rooms that are connected to that, then you have the living room here and so on. And then there's another staircase, and that was hidden in a, uh, in a drawer. So it was not visible, um, uh, and it's connected to the kitchen and the rooms up there. So there is the same division that you have running through the whole city is actually running through the house here, where you have the servants on one side, and we can only guess uh, what color they had, and the, and the masters living in the front, and they, were, they had completely separate kind of ecosystems that they were working, uh, living in, uh, only connected by little kind of openings and doors uh, where the food would be brought in. And um, so, anyways, so we made a big party with the neighborhood association. We installed a big dinner table. We, we, there, there was a children's zoo. We, this is my colleague Jan. Uh, there was an ice cream van. The, the, the fire truck opened up the hydrant so the kids could play in the water. Uh, he also got a bit wet. This is Amy Pulitzer, who also came there to, uh, to, to uh, say goodbye to the house. And, uh, and, um, and that, with this goodbye party, we had already achieved one thing, and that was that a lot of people um, that would normally go and see a show at the Pulitzer, but wouldn't really dare going into a neighborhood like that or you know, not walk around there like... Uh, like uh, in, a, in a normal city, came uh, and visited the place because you know, it was a, we were there and Amy was there and everyone was there. So they, they, they all came and made this kind of step into a world they um, normally are avoiding. Um, and, um, and then we brought the house there. This is an image that, we already, that we've already seen. It was a bit difficult, I see. I flipped through this very fast, so you can see the design of this. And uh, in, the, in the front, it was quite intact. On the, in the back, we left it a bit open and um, made an exhibition of all the research that we did. And um, yeah. And the um, most important part was that the neighborhood association, who also had never been on the other side of Delma to visit the Pulitzer Foundation, also came, and with them also all the people that, um, that, that knew about the story. Um, and um, what we did then was when we made this tour with the Space Buster um, three years after this exhibition, we came again to the site because in the meantime, the staff of the Pulitzer had discussed with the Neighborhood Association what to do with the site now, now that the house is gone. And, um, and they have decided to, uh, to uh, install a butterfly garden, which I think is very good because we need pollinators uh, and we have to make space for pollinators and we have to plant plants for pollinators so we can keep them. Um, and uh, the Pulitzer found a, a young landscape architect, and then together with him, we kind of inaugurated the, the site and, uh, and, and, and prepared it uh, for the planting. Uh, there was a dinner in the Space Buster and the picnic, and we've, uh, we've also you know, made a little work with questions. We like questions, as you know. Um, and. Uh, and we started building a, a, a new kind of staircase up that was then later on um, uh, designed with the, with the bricks of the house um, because the bricks is the only valuable thing of the house. And part of it, like two pallets, I think, were used for the staircase and the other five pallets were given to the neighborhood association so they can finance their youth activities with it. This is, there's any questions at this point? Maybe it's better to ask about this now than later. <laughs> what does all this have to do with ambiguity tolerance? No, okay, that seems to be clear. Very good, I'm glad that it's so clear. Um, the other one was ah, transforming urban p 
practice. Okay, so we go there. Here we go. So, um, the um, Temple of Airfield is um, in the center of the city. Uh, we, have, uh, we have three airports in Berlin, uh, or we had three airports. One was uh, Tempelhof, that was the first airport, that, uh, also the first airport in Germany. And the, um, then there was Tegel, uh, that got closed two years ago, I think. And now we only have Schönefeld because Tempelhof and Tegel are closed. And the question uh, that arose uh, was what to do with Temple of. But g going back a little bit into history, so Temple of was uh, made into an airport because it was a big lawn outside the city that was used for all kinds of field trips uh, and also the first kind of flying experiments. And it was also used by the Prussian army to make exercises. And then we had these, all these kind of Lindbergh, Lilienthal kind of uh, flying experiments, and then the, the first uh, uh, German airport was installed there, also the founding airport of the Lufthansa, and, um, and uh, uh, these Zeppelins and so on looked like this. Funny to see what an airport looked like at that time. And then at some point um, in uh, the late 30s, um, the government at that time decided that we need a bigger airport, um, and uh, we all know <laughs> what government that was. Uh, and uh, so there was a design competition, and this kind of m massive uh, uh, building that you see up here, that half moon shaped building, uh, was decided upon. There was a time when we had two airport buildings, and uh, the first, because actually the government didn't need an airport, they needed a place to produce bombers for the Second World War, uh, and they also installed the first concentration camp beside Temple of Airport for the workers in that uh, factory. And um, I go very fast through this because it's not what I really want to talk about, but you can ask questions if you want. Uh, and uh, that's also why the area around Temple of Airport was heavily bombed uh, during the Second World War. And um, uh, then, the, then the notion of Temple of switched a bit at the time, uh, the years between 65 and 67, I suppose it was, when uh, Berlin was um, cut up uh, from, uh, from, from the, the, the rest of Western Germany, or West Berlin was cut up from the rest of West Germany uh, and had to be fed by these aeroplanes there. Every two minutes they loaded an aeroplane to feed the two million people in Berlin. Uh, and uh, so that was a kind of a positive notion. And then uh, after 89, when the wall came down and the reunification happened, uh, there was a decision that, uh, Ber that maybe an inner city airport is not the um, hot contemporary thing to have anymore. So um, there was a decision to close it uh, in 2008. Now, the question was, of course, what happens next? And the, uh, the, the, the political um, decision was that, you know, of course, uh, yes, it's good to have uh, open space, but we also need space for the building industry uh, and the real estate market. And we you know, and anyways, Berlin needs uh, more apartments. At that time, it was bit questionable, now it's a bit different, but uh, uh, so there was a decision to at least uh, uh, define certain areas, and these are the red areas, you know, uh, as uh, kind of uh, new housing, housing estates, and, um, and uh, leave the, the center part of the taxiway, that's the round thing, and of course the runways, the two like long light green strips, um, free. But as if you know about urban planning, you also know that these processes between a decision that's been taken and the realization uh, can take many, many years. 
I suppose, around 15 to 20 years uh, to realize something like that. Also taking into account that the whole area had to be cleared from possible bombs that are still underground. So, um, and you know, there need to be competitions, there need to be designs, there need to be uh, political decisions, it need, uh, the whole like, planning process is just very complicated, and then starts the building and, and so on. So uh, 15 years at least. So the question that the city had, and that was interesting, was what happens in between? Um, and uh, that's where we came in and where we are allowed to work in a team that is, um, that is uh, making plans only for these kind of 15 years, or maybe 10, they thought 10 years, but we knew it's more uh, that, uh, in between. And our uh, proposal was this, that we, um, that we, instead of this kind of typical urban mechanism of master planning, we impose a kind of a more um, a strategic way how um, new ideas of urbanity can invade this site and how, uh, how this can also become something that is kind of manifest in the future of the site. So this is a, um, this is a very, very simple idea. I think I don't have to explain it. You have five years to experiment and then five years of consolidation of these ideas. And, um, and then um, that led to this plan here. As you can see, we are already behind that. And it didn't happen uh, for several reasons. The, um, but th this is the way that we are thinking these processes because we, are, you know, we also have, that, that's part of our argumentation is that if we want a city, we want, and we want a city where uh, the people in the city also get the chance to, uh, to maybe participate or maybe you know, actively uh, intervene into these processes, we have to give these spaces, we have to invent these formats where it's possible, and, these, uh, and within these, then these formats have to be somehow also be, um, they, they have to be public, they have to be looked at, uh, they have to be um, um, also, th th there needs to be decisions, what of these things is something that could be good for the future, what is only very, you know, uh, within the, the time that we are in, um, and, uh, and, and to, to kind of, mediate and argument this, we make these kind of uh, diagrams that, uh, that also keep a lot of things very blurry, but it shows that we are thinking in a strategic way <laughs> uh, over time. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is that there's uh, all this long-term top-down processes, uh, the uh, competition about a housing estate at Columbia Dam, that actually means the site where the floating university is. Uh, the international building exhibition, that was an idea that there w should be another, a third Berlin international building exhibition in 2017. Uh, and the uh, IGA is the international garden exhibition. These were all ideas that were projected on the Temple of Airfield at that time. And um, if you know a bit about the history of Berlin, nothing of that happened. The, uh, the international building exhibition was cut by the mayor. Uh, the international garden exhibition went to the outskirts of the city because there was already a bit too much wind against it to having, because it's always, it always means you have a closed uh, park where people have to pay entrance, and that uh, was not a good idea. And, uh, and all the construction never happened. Um, and this went like that. But, um, but here's, here, here are the plans that we, that, that we made. One, one of the tools that we proposed what that was that there should be um, something that we call pioneer fields that should be um, implemented uh, where um, basically people can come with an idea and do what they want. Um, and as we know that Berlin is a very creative city, uh, we know that these things uh, can be very successful. Then there was another movement at the same time that was a movement uh, that uh, proposed to squat the airport and just take it for the city because it was still fenced off. Um, and uh, this uh, created like the biggest police uh, 
action that Berlin has ever seen. The thing was that there was nobody who actually wanted to squat it. It was a, you know, it was a fake. <laughs> but uh, still, the city spent so much money on protecting uh, Temple of Airfield against squatters uh, that could have financed a couple of years of cultural program uh, there. Um, anyways, the, um, these are just some figures. Um, and then the opening actually happened. So 2010, the reopening happened, and it was a big success. Uh, we started uh, to, uh, also in this to come with one of our mobile activators. This one's called the, the Knot. Uh, it's a truck uh, that kind of ha has a lot of things inside that you can unfold, uh, like the, the city mattress here and these funny Haribo colored roofs, uh, and it comes with program and, and so on. Uh, and uh, it wasn't really necessary, but it was still good to have that there, also to say that this is a place where you can do these things, where these things can happen. Now, at the same time, we had a little bit, we were still a bit afraid that even though the International Building, building and Garden Exhibition didn't happen, maybe the city of Berlin could get the idea of applying to make an expo. Um, that's the next thing, you know, that you can do. Ah, we make a, we make a world fair. Um, and uh, then we looked at the site and we saw that it actually is bigger than the Hanover Expo in 2000. And, um, and it's also, it's about the size of the Shanghai Expo that was there before. So, and with these stupid Berlin politicians, you can be sure there's one uh, liberal guy who says, it's a super good idea that gets everybody behind him. And then the, the dream of this Expo is that it sweeps a lot of money into the city and things are getting possible that weren't possible before, but, um, um, but we already knew that we would be afraid of that. So what we did was we made our own expo. Um, we um, we ra fundraised um, quite a lot of money and uh, we declared that uh, together with the theater in Berlin, we make an expo because the, the idea was that if we make an expo, the city can't make an expo anymore. <laughs> it's a bit of a dangerous game, but anyways. So we made this expo in 2012 that we called the, the, the Great World's Fair with a subtitle, The World is Not Fair. And we invited um, a, a lot of artists to, um, to design pavilions because pavilions is actually the nice part about expos, no? Uh, that there's all these iconic pavilions in the past of uh, world fairs that you know, we as architects are st still find amazing and we would love to see them back. Uh, some of them are still or again back and, uh, and uh, some never came back, like uh, Le Corbusier here. And, uh, and we thought that uh, that's a nice task. So we want to design expo pavilions. Um, and, um, but we, of course, we want to do it our way. And there was, there's these buildings um, that are on the Temple of Airfield that, are, that have like strange different uses. Some of them are weather stations, others are radars and antennas and, and maintenance things. And then also some buildings that belong to the US Army. Um, and we decided to take these buildings and transform them into expo pavilions. Um, and uh, we also made this incredible drawing here uh, that um, um, took us a lot of time because uh, we, um, in, in this drawing, we collected all the iconic buildings that were ever built in the whole history of world fairs, and we put them all on the Temple of Field uh, to see you know, what it looks like. It's not a planning, it's more, um, more um, you know, a game. Uh, I think. Uh, but this uh, drawing we decided to put on top of that building that I just saw together with the artist Erik Göngrich uh, to have an, a pavilion that actually talks about the history of ex uh, world fairs. Um, and uh, here it is. Uh, so that's the same building that you've seen before, just a slightly transformed um, and kind of camouflaged a bit in the color code of the airport. Um, and uh, you, can, uh, you can go up there, and from that terrace up there, you can see this kind of um, 
image of um, the great world fair, how it could be on Temple of Field. That's another building that's, that's actually my, my favorite building. It's still there. It looks like nothing. It looks like a garage, but it is the building that uh, housed the weather balloon of the German weather forecast. So there was this big helium balloon that was left into the air once or twice a day to, uh, to measure uh, the, uh, the, the, the coming weather in the stratosphere somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I, I always liked the idea of this kind of globe that came out of that thing like, like a parking garage and then went up and came down again. It's, and uh, as a globe is an, an important factor of a, uh, of a world fair, uh, we decided to, um, to use that. Uh, and together with uh, uh, Construct Lab, we, we've, we've designed this uh, auditorium that is also a very nice auditorium because you can take it apart. And uh, we invited the Institute for Spatial Experiments with Olaf Ue Eliasson and a lot of super, super cool students. Uh, to use it for the time of our event as uh, their experimental ground. We also made um, uh, a pavilion that was uh, a, a, a stage for a performance by the Japanese uh, theater maker Toshiki Okada. The, uh, you have to think that Fukushima just happened the year before, and, uh, and also 9-11 uh, uh, happened the year before, and uh, we looked at the images, and it was uh, amazing how similar uh, the, the images uh, looked. And, um, and then we built this pavilion from a reused uh, stage set of the Haus der Kultur in der Welt, the House of the Culture of the, of the World, where we inherited a lot of wood uh, from um, a, a crazy show that they had for two weeks. And we built these, uh, our pavilions with it. Um, and uh, here it is. And, uh, and he made a performance in there. The, um, and many others. V super good artists, very good things uh, that they did. But I want to get uh, closer to the Florida University. So um, the, uh, still there were, um, there were these plans. Um, the designers were chosen to design garden things. Uh, houses and so on, and we were sitting there thinking what could happen, and then they made this pavilion where they displayed the, the planning. They called it participation, whereas you know, Bürgerbeteiligung is actually participation, but the people in Berlin, they don't believe in these type of top-down participation ideas, so uh, it looked a bit like this after two days. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it was clear nobody wanted it. Uh, and then there was a group that was super smart, and they, they were called 100% Tempelhof. And they wrote a law, and, uh, and as in our democratic system, you can actually um, make a poll for a law that you want to impose. And with the general elections, there, was also, there also came a small paper where you could cross yes and no if you want that law or not. Um, and uh, that law said no construction whatsoever, any time in the future, on Temple of Feld. And the whole thing has to stay open for the, for the public as it is, because we love it as it is. You know, we don't want any, any real estate investors' fantasies here. And uh, I didn't believe that it would work, but it worked. Uh, more than 50% of the Berliners voted for this law, and, uh, and that meant that the, um, the Senate of Berlin had to react on it and actually put this law into function, which meant that nothing's up to, up to today not exactly nothing, because there was a refugee camp that was built, but <laughs> that was under different circumstances, so uh, nobody said something against it. And um, so the whole Temple of Feld uh, is, uh, is uh, protected by this law. Uh, now, this is an old map, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm showing you something, because here we can see uh, an important part of the infrastructure, that is this here. And that is uh, 
that is the rainwater basin where the floating university is. And you can see that there is this gutter here that is led into it. And it collects all the water from all these, all these uh, pay, uh, 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 concrete surfaces, plus all the water from all these roofs, plus also a bit of water from the street here. And it's all running in there. Um, we'll show you later. Um, and uh, ah, this is why it's there. Because it's on the other side of the road, and it was forgotten. Uh, to be included into the law. Now, we thought that maybe that, that, that's, that's a good idea, but it's also a danger because um, it's not protected. Uh, on the other hand, it's the only reason why maybe still, because there, something else that got blocked a bit was you know, we can't do things like the, the, the World's Fair there anymore because it's the construction. <laughs> And <laughs> it's a bit difficult. It's a situation that needs to be worked on. But, uh, but we knew that in the rainwater basin, we can still do things. And we can, uh, we can use it as a threshold to uh, protect us. Now, these are these, just some impressions from the field. And, uh, and now I come to the floating university. But I have to change into the other show. How much time did I spend? What time is it? Andres? Okay. I just do it, right? So, floating university. Up, up, up. Um, this is uh, 2018. Doesn't look like that anymore. But So as I said, this is the site. This is where the gutter goes, and then it goes in a tunnel underneath that ends in the basin here, and it's never that blue because uh, it's, a, it's, it's a stormwater basin, so it's only filled with water when, when it rains, when it rains heavily. But it's an important infrastructure in the city of Berlin because um, uh, the city of Berlin has um, um, uh, 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 a mixed sewage system. So that means that the water and the shit goes in the same canal. Uh, that was uh, an invention by uh, the, the Berlin uh, sewage water engineer and, and plus the main urban planner of the 19th century, James Hobrecht, who went around the world and then found this in Chicago and he said, that's good, we do it. And that's the interesting thing. I, I, I talked yesterday with a friend uh, about, the, the, for example, the subway in, uh, in, in New York City. That was built also you know, a long time ago, and it's still working the same way. It's almost impossible to change it. Same thing with, uh, with uh, water infrastructure, at least in the middle of this, in the center of the city. It was built in the 19th century. And it's still the same, still works well, um, except for uh, moments of heavy rain. When there's heavy rain, um, it's too much water for the sewage system. Um, so there's these spillovers um, that go into the river. And that's an ecological nightmare, as you can imagine. So every time there's a spillover, there's a lot of dying fish, and they, you know, it's, it's just too much uh, uh, nutrients uh, in the water and so on. It's, it, you know, uh, it's a time that we don't, don't want to go back to. Anyway, so that's why it's important that this water gets collected somewhere and then slowly given into the river. Uh, and that it, there's also, uh, of, especially in areas like that where you have a lot of paved surface, there's, um, the, the water goes, um, uh, the, the water is being collected and then, um, so that's what the, what the basin is for. Uh, no, this way. Um, We don't. What is this? Ah, I've already talked about it on, in the last lecture. So I'll go through this very fast. And so here we go. This is the basin when we first saw it. And the, uh, the reason why the images are there is we've, um, uh, when we made the World Fair, that was the moment when we found out that this basin exists. Because 
you can uh, you cannot see it uh, from the street. It's uh, it's up there, but and this is uh, the canal where the water comes in. But it's surrounded. You can see it here uh, by a ring of allotment gardens, and they are so green and have trees and little houses on them that from the street streets around you don't see it. Uh, and also the basin, of course, is eight meter going down, so it's. Uh, it was in, invisible, and when, uh, so that's also, and, and the allotment gardens have a fence around it. Uh, so there's only 100 allotment gardeners who had, for 50 years, had the key uh, to go into that basement, uh, basin. And, um, and there's lots and lots of people that live in the surrounding neighborhoods that, that are still today, four years after we've opened it up, four years, you know, the Golden Lion and so on, they still come in and say, I didn't know that this is here, because it was, you know, and it's, um, and, and that's another funny thing about it, because uh, that's the proof that we found it at that time, because on that drawing that I've sh showed before with all the iconic buildings, uh, we have put the, uh, the new Raumlabo headquarters into, uh, into the basin already in 2012. Now, um, the, the, we never dreamt of it. We just saw it and thought it's it's an interesting place. This I've talked about. And then um, in uh, 2018, we the, somehow the the weather had changed because when we made that drawing, it was before the uh, the public poll for that law, and after uh, it was clear that there will be no construction on Temple of Airfield the prices for real estate around the Temple of Airfield rose enormously. Uh, and, and, and we now have like a, a, a corner of Neukölln that used to be really <laughs> the last corner where you want to live right beside the airport. Uh, you know, nobody wanted to live there, so it really had very, very low rents. Uh, it's now one of the most expensive parts of Berlin where you can find an apartment. And, um, and because of that, we already saw the truffle pigs of the real estate industry sneaking around all, you know, all corners of, uh, of, the, uh, of the area. And we thought, uh, because we like this basin to be just this kind of secret place, but we thought it's not going to stay secret for long. So now we have to put a foot in the door. And to put a foot in the door, uh, as we architects, we made this archigram-like idea. Uh, uh, we, we, we're going to build this offshore uh, place for cities and transformation, whatever it is. And it took us three years to, uh, uh, of, of difficult um, diplomacy to actually make it happen. But then, surprise, surprise, it happened. Uh, and here it is. So um, I don't, you know, maybe it's too much to talk about all the difficulties we have gone through, but the interesting thing was that um, as the, the, the basin uh, is part of the infrastructure of the airport, uh, it, there is a company that is in charge of, uh, of the maintenance of the airport and, and renting out spaces and keeping it, uh, keeping it running. Uh, the airport building, it's called the Temple of Projekt GmbH, and they are also in charge of uh, this basin, and they are owned by the city, and uh, so the way was actually to persuade somebody in the in the uh, urban planning office um, to uh, to put a word in with the director of this company to give us a contract to make this uh, cultural thing for one year. Uh, that was one thing, um, and, uh, and it happened. And, and the other thing was, if you want to do something like that, you need money. Right? Where do you get the money? Uh, I'm, I know that in the United States, that's quite difficult. You, either you find a billionaire and you build something like Little Island, and then it is uh, also like Little Island. But if you want to have, um, the, if you don't want to go that way, uh, and it, this is actually more difficult in, uh, in Germany, uh, you apply for cultural funding because we have that. Um, and, um, and there was uh, the, the lucky coincidence that um, in, when we thought about this in 2000, 
2017, we knew that in 2019 there will be the 100-year Bauhaus anniversary. And um, anniversary is always moments when public funding is filling up a big pot with money and putting it into the middle of the cultural institutions and artists and so on. And they say, whoever wants to have a share can write an application now. So it's the same with you know, the Boyce birthday, uh, Joseph Boyce, uh, uh, or I don't know, it could be Mozart, could be Bach, could be you know, anything, any kind of cultural heritage. If there's an anniversary, there's money. Um, and, um, and we thought that Bauhaus maybe is a good idea. Um, because we were already very, very interested in, the, in, in kind of these learning, learning sites, and that's also, but I, I have to admit it was also a reason um, to design the, or, and, and also to name it the Floating University to get that money. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that also worked out fine, so we uh, were able to realize it, and there's, uh, oops, sorry. Ah. Um, Press the wrong button. You said it before. Um, um, so um, we made this design. We realized that um, this building uh, on the right is, uh, is a design by Atelier Bauau from Tokyo. Um, it, was, uh, it was built for an exhibition in, uh, again, the Haus der Kultur der Welt, where we already inherited the other structure from. And, uh, and we had this, uh, in, in the process, we had this super good idea to, uh, to take it apart together with, uh, with uh, Bao Wow and, uh, and bring it to a place where it makes sense. And the place where we thought it makes sense uh, was uh, the refugee camp in the, um, in the uh, Temple of Hangars uh, that was there in uh, 2015, 16. Um, and um, it took a while, but then we managed to build it up there as a kindergarten. Well, that was before we wanted to do the floating university. But we, and it wasn't before, but it was a, a way to already get a foot in the door into the Temple of Airport to be able to talk with the director. Uh, it didn't work out that well, but anyways, um, the, um, because the, the, the company that was running the refugee camp was fighting with the director all the time. So they didn't invite him for the inauguration of the children's house. And, but it was still there. That was good. But, uh, and when we, uh, when we uh, then finally started the, the floating university, uh, the, uh, they called us and said, we have to take it down again because the refugee camp is now moving out into containers outside of the building. And, um, and so we had to take it apart again, and then we started planning with it and, uh, and build it up uh, on the site. And it's actually super nice where we talked with, uh, with, with Yoshi Tsukamoto and everything that he said from this kind of, uh, you know, it was a very open structure. And then he said, but if you put it there, you, uh, it looks a bit like a Chinese tea pavilion and you have to make these sliding doors. That's why we uh, design, design is the siding. It also needed a roof and so on, but it's still there. It's super good. It's only our only building that we we can close. Um, so there was an auditorium. There was a kitchen up there. There was a water experimental uh, tower uh, and a bar. Uh, and uh, here you see the auditorium, and the auditorium also had this pool in the middle, so people could sit in the water. Uh, on hot days and or just put there it was not always working as you can see uh, and there was uh, a lot of experiments of uh, of all kinds of um, practices on, on one side we invited artists to make workshops and on the other side we thought and that's now I'm coming to your question in the in the beginning uh, no that was before huh? before we this officially started um, uh, the, we, we invited groups of students or groups uh, or, or, or teaching groups from uh, all kinds of different European universities where we knew the teachers. Right? There, there's lots of people and friends in our network that are teaching somewhere and we wrote to them all and said, we have this site now and if you want to come, 
for a week or two or three uh, and, 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 and exercise your research here, and uh, uh, you can do it. And there were about 20 groups of all kinds of students that came in the first year that, um, that all uh, tried out lots of different things. And this is just one example with uh, the, the students from The Hague that were using the site to, I don't know, find, you know this, uh, this guy is uh, making uh, coffee without electricity and, uh, and, and he's making, this, uh, making fire himself and so on and so forth. That it really brought the students also to a kind of different, a different uh, idea. This is an installation that was built by a group uh, of students from Bogota and Munich together, a kind of a bicycle trail that's referring a bit to the history of the site because it used to be, before it was a rainwater base and it was a bicycle racetrack uh, there. Um, and uh, so they, you know, they cleaned up a part and made this kind of bicycle dance space. Uh, then uh, that's a more artistic uh, approach there on the right that is uh, uh, the result of a workshop that uh, Spanish architects, uh, what are they called? Hmm? Tac, thank you, Tac, that's it, uh, made. It's an interspecies meeting place, the first one that we had, the first group that actually pointed out that we need this, and now uh, we know it. And, but there were also you know, all kinds of activists making workshops and so on. Uh, at the same time, we started something that um, became more and more important, and that is the kids' university. So we invited artists to work with kids on the site and uh, make all kinds of things. The, the kids inhabited the site immediately, of course, when they, when they came there. They started walking around with rubber boots. They started uh, uh, looking at uh, animal traces in the mud. Uh, made photos of them and, and, and uh, research on certain things, and they, they told stories about the things that they, or wrote stories about the stuff that they found, and, uh, and told these stories to the grown ups. Um, they looked at the water, of course. There was also workshops together with um, water analysts and uh, chemists and so on. And, uh, and we also, water became a f also a very important aspect there uh, because there is this rainwater and it's being collected and then led into the river. And we all know through these, the swamp city, uh, swamp city uh, uh, um, planning ideas that actually rainwater should, the best for rainwater is if it dissolves at the place where, uh, where it's raining down and it's not being led into the river. Um, and, uh, and the problem with the water in the basin is that through being led over a kind of uh, different kinds of surfaces, the roof surface of the building and then the, also the concrete surface and the, and the road, it's um, highly contaminated with all kinds of things, pesticides, from pesticides to oil to uh, nicotine and so on, and it's all in the water. So the question is, how can it be, um, how can it be clean? So we built a set of different experiments. This is a, uh, a moving bed reactor that uh, is actually is very well working bacteria uh, cleaning system, um, and uh, we also made um, uh, a rainwater collection in the toilet where. Uh, the, the, the water is being collected in the basin in the min middle, and uh, instead of f you know, flushing the toilet uh, uh, um, with, your, with a, you know, a, a box that is filling up with water from somewhere, uh, you have to take the water with, uh, with one of these uh, flowering buckets and, uh, and take it to the toilet and then flush yourself, which makes you a lot more aware of the the water effect. And of course, uh, sometimes the water also is invading the space, and then we have aqua alta uh, and have to deal with it. But uh, we, actually, we are always embracing these moments because it only happens two or three times a year. Uh, and then finally, it happens, and we have put on, all, put on our long rubber boots up to here and start jumping around in it like that. <laughs> uh, and uh, after that, we have to clean up. Um, 
And another thing that we're doing is, of course, the, the spatial experiments that are also very important. Um, this, uh, this was 2018. This is what it looks like at the moment. Uh, this was the in-between time when we didn't have so much money, so we had to reduce and also give back the scaffolding to the scaffolding guy. Um, and we, we built this iceberg, which we thought was very iconic for the situation, uh, and also very beautiful, as you can see, different ways. You can make these marvelous photos there. It's very, very scenic. So it's, it's the perfect Instagram uh, uh, site. And that also, I mean, that's a big plus, of course. And uh, just a few images, what it looks like now. So we have, uh, at the moment, we have a, a kitchen in this kind of building there on the right. And then there's this roof that can move along the rails. And then in the back, in this kind of um, a bit um, Haiti, I know, uh, Hawaii, Hawaiian looking building, that's uh, the bar. Um, this is the moving roof. And there's also a bigger one. I don't know if it's on the floor. The thing, uh, the state of, uh, of the floating university is for the past three years that we have founded an association. Um, and this association uh, is running it. Uh, so it started as an initiative of Raumlabor and me and my colleagues. And, um, and then um, we thought that we want to rest it on more shoulders. And we also want to give it you know, a bit away uh, uh, to, to the city. And the association now is more than 50 members. And these 50 members uh, are this, uh, kind of organized in different kinds of groups that are taking care of all the different aspects, the academic uh, program, the cultural program, the kids program, the maintenance, the architectural experiments, uh, f raising funding, uh, and very, very important lobby work for the city because, uh, as you will see, it's still not so clear. One of the most important things that we've found out is that we have the perfect site to invent new forms of urban practice. Uh, one of them is walking with rubber boots in algae, five centimeter algae water, uh, which is definitely a, a, a very, you know, I don't know, you, you get into these strange moods and that you always saw these groups of two or three people walking together with rubber boots and like really in deep philosophical thoughts. Uh, and, uh, and where do you have that? You know, it's really difficult to create that, uh, uh, that moment. And, um, uh, and there's lots of other things that can, could be done on this because it's all concrete surface. With, uh, with water and algae and grass and so on. And the water is only this deep sometimes. Sometimes it's completely gone, like you can see here, uh, on, on dry summers like this. It's, there's nothing. It's, it's only uh, the, the, one of the things that happened now is that the, uh, our landlord, who thought that we would only stay for a year, <laughs> <laughs> we're a bit surprised that we organized ourselves in a way and made a lot of lobby work to stay. Uh, and then they found out that they are responsible for this place. And with this kind of response of this responsibility, they started uh, seeing that they're also responsible for the maintenance of the public infrastructure. Now, one idea of the public infra infrastructure is that the water is coming in and running out. Um, uh, now, the outflow is constantly blocked by these reeds that you see there. Because they, as they are growing on concrete, whenever there's high water, they move towards the outflow. So what they are doing is they are taking, with big machines, the reeds away from the outflow so that the water can go out. The other thing that they found out, as, and we knew it already, is that it's highly contaminated mud that is there, which is something that, you know, in the best Donna Haraway way staying with the trouble is exactly what we need to have in front of us to take the right decisions for the future. And, uh, and we've, uh, uh, what, what they're doing now every now and then, every couple of weeks, is coming with a big machine and scraping the mud off uh, our holy mud. Uh, and, uh, uh, and other things is that they don't, 
And now, one more thing is that, of course, there's also a big uh, variety of, um, of all kinds of animals. And um, the, uh, our landlord had this idea that actually we like is that it becomes an irrigation zone so that they finally block the outflow, uh, take away the concrete, and then the, the water can irrigate into the water or could be activated in other ways. Uh, that is still needs to be decided. And for that, they had to make a biological survey. And this biological survey uh, created, um, over a year, created a list of animals that are living there. And of course, there's amphibia, frogs, and others. And, uh, and that was given to the, uh, to the district's nature um, authorities. And they said, oh, that's frogs. Then we know you're walking around there with rubber boots in the water. And sometimes the kids are even walking in the reed. We said, no, 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 not in the breeding period. They never walk in reeds because uh, we all know that you know, there's lots of birds and other animals breeding there. But they, uh, then they said, no, but you're not allowed to walk there anymore. So um, the, uh, all these nice moments of walking around with rubber boots in this marvelous basin uh, and, and doing experiments uh, with uh, uh, fl floodings in the base, basin, they don't happen anymore. We have a constant drought now because the water is flowing out very fast. Uh, and it's not being cleaned by the reed anymore before it goes out into the, the, the river. So all these marvelous situations are belong to the past at the moment, uh, and um, let me see. Um, that's the way that we organize as an association because we have to keep away from the concrete. That is, well, you know, of course, we have to ask for a permission every year again. Uh, and now they said, you only get the permission if you uh, put up these signs that uh, nobody's allowed to walk anywhere beside on your wooden structures. Uh, and you have to get rid of these rubber boots. So you know, all these rubber boots, they're a bit we could have new rubber boots, maybe. But, but uh, they really said, we don't want to see these rubber boots anymore. Because as long as you have these rubber boots, people are going to put them on and walk around the, uh, wherever. And uh, so we had to clean that off. Rubber boots are gone. Uh, and we have, to, we have basically all the wooden structures to walk on, which is, it bugs me. Really, the space is getting smaller. The you know, space of experimentation is getting smaller. And it's getting more and more bureaucratized. And even us, as an association, we, we start to have this kind of, do we re should we really obey these stupid uh, rules that are put upon us just be because we want to have the next permission for next year? And or shouldn't we do it? So there's all these discussions that somehow you could say they're interesting, but they're also uh, um, they prevent us from thinking about, hey, what could be the next interesting topic that we could tackle here? Um, uh, so what I'm, um, what I'm uh, uh, trying to do at the moment, that's my, my latest strategy, is for this uh, festival that um, I'm um, making uh, this October um, that is uh, called Re-Educate Me, a post-fossil theme park um, uh, that is kind of trying to transfer strategies of, um, of sustainability from the Japanese Edo period. That was the time when Japan was closed off from the rest of the world, and they had to live with the resources they had on the islands. And everything that, uh, that we know and love about Japan was created basically at that time, including sushi. Um, you know, if you can only cook rice um, uh, once a week, and you have to eat cold rice with raw fish uh, the rest of the week. Uh, you, the only thing you can do is put some algae around it. Right? Um, and uh, because, yeah, 
and, and many other things like you know, the kimono and, uh, and but also a lot of very very uh, important and interesting art forms you know that the where the 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 reduction of the everyday life also kind of boiled down and distilled you know, in poetry and in performance and in muni music, all these kind of, mini the, the, all the minimalism that we know from Japan comes from 250 years of uh, no import and export, basically, and, and taking care of the country that you, uh, the, the, the land and, the, 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 and so on. So we, we looked at that, we made a symposium about that, and we invited 20 artists to listen to the scientists and historians that we invited uh, in Tokyo and Berlin at the same time, so it was streamed like tonight, and uh, and uh, and they are trying to make this kind of translation act uh, into uh, contemporary art. And one idea that uh, came up there is from a uh, the, uh, an artist couple called Maya Franz, and um, what they want to do is they want to uh, build these guitars out of dead uh, Berlin street, street trees, because we're losing about 1,000 street trees, uh, trees that stand in the street every year. Uh, and they, they are proposing that we could um, build these guitars with it. And then I thought, that's good. These are no rubber boots for sure. And they are also our own wooden constructions. It's a kind of a minimal architecture that is permission-free because if you walk, you know, if you go with a pair of sandals to the building authorities and you ask for permission, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to, they will say it's permission-free. So we have these permission-free wooden structures to walk on, and that's my next step: is that we get the people back into the basin on these gaitas. I think that's it. Thank you. All right, you, you asked yourself a question, um, which is uh, uh, what do all of that um, political price, uh, uh, you know, building project, mm -hmm. what does that have to do with ambiguity? Actually, ambiguous tolerance, because mm. I love both of words, mm. and we've used both words many times in our, um, you know, just kind of explanation of how we approach architecture, but I always understood ambiguity and tolerance mm. as almost a, the opposite operation. With tolerance, you have to have two things, and then they kind of move, you know, they do this dance with each other and have to leave that space, that's the third space in between, mm. versus ambiguity is like one thing that maybe can be interpreted in multiple ways. So there's this kind of, a, you know, diffuse bifurcation that happens, right? So. What do you mean by ambiguous tolerance? Well, ambiguity tolerance, that was what your, your, your word was, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, it's, I think some, one thing that is, is good to realize is that we live in places that are created through all kinds of different mindsets. And, uh, and some of them we like, and some of them we really don't like. Uh, and, and, but they are still part of our environment and our built environment and our social environment. And, um, and I think it's, um, and, and some of them, you know, some of these mindsets still exist and some are kind of slowly transforming. Uh, and, uh, and also there's new ideas and new mindsets like, you know, Fridays for Future, for example, you know, that, asking for different ways and, uh, and, uh, and of course there's still, there's always different opinions how these things go, uh, how, how, how our um, surroundings, or especially the urban surroundings, have to be transformed. And, um, and I think with ambiguity, the, you know, the, 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 the ambiguity about that is that they all exist like parallel worlds at the same time uh, and that we, maybe we don't have to embrace them and find it all super good, but we have to accept, first of all, that this is the way and it has, there's a lot of historical background that led to this. 
and um, and um, and that also like if you look into the future there's like all, you know, all kinds of different streams that want different ways and we have to tolerance doesn't mean that you have to uh, necessarily find um, find a, um, uh, a compromise but it means that you tolerate that this exists and then you can start with the struggle you know, the, the democratic struggle maybe as well and finding uh, finding other people uh, that you know or companions that that think the same um, I think this is this is what I mean and you need a both operations yeah. to, to live with the ambiguity of uh, democracy <laughs> You started by saying something that I thought was super beautiful, and then later I thought it was also very funny. Um, when you said the story of Ramhabor is also the story of Berlin, mm -hmm. um, and then you showed us the slide about, and you talked about the book project taking mm -hmm. a really long time, which is also very exciting that it's coming. Um, and then you talked about, and I, oh, I forgot what it was, um, what it was called. Uh, that sort of gap between that mm -hmm. exists in German or oh, German bureaucracy, yeah. That like, what is what is the phrase of uh, what is it called again? The the, the 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 gap between the real the 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 idea, the, 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 the idea and the yeah. master plan and the realization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was like this particular this German word they used, but I forget. Um, and it seems to me, though, I mean, that this kind of that ambiguity tolerance, this idea that has to be you know, trained and learned is to, to me after, you know, after hearing it expressed in this way, I somehow like kind of unlocked a lot of the projects that I had been familiar with, but hadn't like fully strung them together um, in this, this connected way through learning, through education, through making these opportunities for people to come together in conversation to develop maybe, um, not a tolerance, but first an understanding. Mm. I think that's what's been so, so incredible about a lot of your work, and especially the earlier work. And so I wonder, you know, if you think about, um, you know, floating, the future of floating, for example, but also of other, your project, sort of like the Ramabur project within the educational institution. I wonder how, if you can like maybe talk about that a bit more, um, for those of us trying to maybe grapple with you know, how to make those spaces within the understanding that many of us operate within either an institution or, you know, within, you know, the confines of practice in a particular way. So we can't, yeah, so I wonder if you could. That was a journey. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if I, if I start from the, from the, the, the destination, <laughs> the way you had it, um, I um, I think what, what I thought a lot about um, the uh, the floating university that also housed another uh, learning experiment that we did. That's called the Making Future School. Um, that was for one year happening in the floating university, and the second year happened in the Haus der Statistik, which is another big project that we are running in in Berlin, and. Um, and that's, um, that's a project that my colleague Markus uh, was, um, was leading. He's uh, teaching at the, at the um, Art Academy in Berlin. And he is making this project also with, you know, not with the money from the school, but with money from some kind of, I think even from the building ministry or something. That, that was just a pot of money that was put somewhere and he grabbed it and said, okay, we're gonna do this now. And, and that was um, uh, that was super good, but super difficult at the same time. So one, one, uh, the thing that was super good was that there was this money, but to administrate the money through the university was a nightmare. And I think that's the same everywhere. You, you, you fundraise, and then through the kind of treadmills of the institution, it becomes kind of difficult to use. Um, and uh, what was the, the trick that he found was that the money, 
that it, that it was a collaboration between the, uh, the UDICA, the, the Academy of Arts in Berlin, the Floating University, and Raumlabor, so that the money could actually go through <laughs> Raumlabor uh, and then given you know, into these kind of learning experiments. That, so you always have to think of these kind of administrative tricks as well. And what I found out by making the, the Floating University um, and inviting all my friends that, uh, that are teaching somewhere in universities, they were all so super happy that they could go to a place where, you know, it's almost like the bed is made. You know, they, they, they don't have to argue anything with the university. Everything that they have to do is bring the students there and start the work. But creating a space like that out of a system like a university, at least, I mean, I'm talking Europe at the moment, I don't know how it is here, but it's, 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 it's super difficult. So it's, it's very good if, you, if there's, um, you know, if there is an, a new initiative that is also a bit independent from the university that is building up this kind of Black Mountain College or whatever, uh, and then uh, opening it up as a, as a new kind of playground institute uh, towards the universities. And uh, because that makes, you know, it makes it kind of independent from that, from that uh, administrative body. So that, I think that uh, this, because I, I see it wherever I go, wherever I talk to everyone, and, and wherever I'm invited, there's all these super cool people teaching that in their professional life are making crazy projects. And when they, when, they, when they start trying to, when they try to do this with their students, they kind of get gray hair. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think there's modes to do this. And, and I think this is also why, 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 why a lot of people love this idea of a floating university. Because it's opening up this door. Um, and maybe we can do it more. I have some follow-up questions still about the ambiguity, but I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll just say one thing that I think that um, I think though that the to me it seemed that the success of of being able to find I mean to find these funding sources and and then also within you know the framework of Tempelhof to to understand how to navigate bureaucracy in a particular way um, also has a lot to do with your um, your skills and abilities as researchers, um, which is not, as you said, it's not a, a separate practice, but it's often treated as such, yes, like in, in learning uh, in the framework of education. So I wonder, um, sorry, I'm asking you a lot to just expand on things, I'm sorry for that, but, but I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, um, maybe for your own personal experience, if that was, if that's something that you've, you've thought about, like, mm, explicitly in terms of, you know, uh, you know, how you then communicate or, or share that kind of process with others or, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, um, that uh, c coming back to uh, the, your initial point, you know, that Raumler was connected to the, 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 the past uh, 22 years of history in Berlin, uh, I think we were, um, the city just offered a lot of possibilities to, um, to, to, to start certain projects and, and temporary things. And, and you probably all know that, you know, all the, all the art and music scene in Berlin and how they just invaded spaces and, and, um, and, and, made a lot of experiments and tried out things and that was uh, super attractive. It was super good that we were in the city at that time because it's getting more and more difficult like everywhere. Um, but we, we kind of saved certain ways of doing things. Like I think um, this research part was not very strong in the beginning of our, you know, we basically had ideas and realized them. Uh, and uh, and these ideas, of course, came out of a certain kind of blurry feeling about sites and locations and cultural formats. Um, 
and um, but uh, the longer we stayed there, the more we found out that actually the um, all this experience that we've gained by just doing things uh, is also part of that research and gives us a lot of knowledge uh, that we can activate also when we come to other places. So when we're now invited to um, a place like Pristina in Kosovo, where we've been this summer, uh, we, um, that we, we have these activation tools that still need to be adapted to the to the site and we still need and we, we know that we can't just uh, take something and impose it to us any any other place uh, but we we know that we have to go there and talk and understand and find out how you know all the uh, how, how a site like the site that we were given in Pristina which was an old brick factory um, that was used basically as a DIY place for um, recycling industry. You could also say it was a garbage dump. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, 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 that it's necessary before we, we start with any kind of intervention there and any kind of planning process that we have to understand the rules and the, and the ways that, that it's working there. Plus, we have to understand the local politics. We have to understand how the, you know, we have to understand, we, we have to look at the history of the site and so on before we actually start doing things. And then still, we, uh, what we're doing should be more um, uh, uh, creating a common ground to start the discussion than to, um, but even to create the common ground to start a discussion, you have to make a planning and so on. So we have, um, yeah, and the other thing when you when 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 you go into you know, the academic learning environment, that's what I'm um, what I always find the most difficult is it's not so difficult to go together with uh, with students into the city and make a research. Um, the 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 difficulty is to make the translation into a planning, um, <laughs> and uh, and there is you know a lot a lot of people who have not the experience in doing things uh, also don't really know, you know. They have these two languages, the language of research and the language of planning, but it, somehow it doesn't, doesn't work together. And then the language of planning always asks for buildings uh, in architectural faculties. And the, the research maybe says, no, <laughs> you know, why are you thinking about buildings? Maybe people have to think songs and eat good food and you, you know and they have to find ways how to harvest all these fruits that are growing on the street uh, the trees that are uh, on the side of the road and so on and so on so you know that uh, th these are the findings of a research that you do on site and then and then how to make a building out of that it's uh, the good thing is the good news is we don't need so many new buildings so we can with a good conscience as architects, concentrate on, um, on more you know, the soft factors of space. Mm. I, the, um, I mean, if, if it's about sites in the city where we live and practice for, for many years, it's not so difficult because we, we, we know where, you know, but still I can be surprised in Berlin, but it's, it's more the question when, when, you, when you come to, I don't know, um, 
a city in Taiwan or, uh, or a, a, city, a city in Italy that we are not so well acquainted with um, to, um, to actually find these sites. And then it, it, it is just enormously important that we have uh, uh, local partners that, um, that, that are working a bit in our direction, that know the city and so on. So we need these agents for sure that help us find the right areas. And still, I think we, we, it's also a way, um, a part of our research is really sneaking into all the corners <laughs> and not being afraid to go somewhere <laughs> and, uh, and so on. But, um, um, uh, and we also have, I think we've developed a kind of a good nose um, for, uh, for the sites that we're looking at, and these are um, very often sites that you know, it's it's really about the potential of a site. So seeing a potential that, so it's in a, in a sense it's not so different from uh, somebody like one of these truffle pigs of the real real estate agent who knows you know okay this is you know this is a this is an area that is. Uh, emerging and it will be, you know, it will become more expensive. So maybe we go and have a look around there, and then uh, or location scout for uh, for movies, or you know, and, and it's about uh, it's, a, it's a bit like that. I mean, you all there's always a question how um, if a site is super cool, um, but it's outside the city, how do I get the people there? <laughs> That's difficult. So a site, you know, it's closer to people is a lot easier. Or close to kind of public transport and so on. Uh, and, and it's also um, um, a question of what, what, what is there that can be activated. I um, think that we are a lot more open also to activating non-human species. <laughs> and, um, um, and, uh, and so on. I, there's not really a recipe. It's a, it's a learning. Yeah, I appreciate that question. Uh, that, I appreciate that question as well. There's so I I I I have never seen you speak before, so I have this startling feeling like there's so much in common with some of the questions that we're always facing here, and you of course aren't surprised by that. But but with um, I was thinking in the '80s there was a gallery in New York. I wasn't here. I was in California, but. It grew to be quite prominent. You probably heard of it. it was called the Fun Gallery. And it was it was run by a gallery. Maybe you know it, Andres. Patty Astor. She showed graffiti art, and when before graffiti art existed, but people started sending her slides. She said, "I'd like to be represented by your gallery. Can I meet you?" And her reply was, "Start your own gallery. Start your own war. I don't want to show you how to do this." And uh, it was you know trying to maintain the idiosyncratic quality rather than allow it to become. So that, I mean, I read that when I was like 20 years old and I thought, whoa, that's an interesting person. I'd like to know her. But the reason I bring it up is that I think you, when you describe Pruitt Igo, that image and the way Charles Jenks mobilized it, I was an undergrad when that image and that statement was made. What you, I think, did very articulately there was start to show that there's another story about why that could have happened. And one big thing was the Brooks Amendment. The Brook Amendment is uh, Senator Brook, Massachusetts, managed to get a bill through Congress that set public housing rent at 25% of household income, which dramatically accelerated a shift in the population in public housing. If you had a good income, you left because your rent actually went up. And after the Brook Amendment, public housing became far more monolithically poor and more monolithically racial. But that kind of story, like then allows the building to come apart socially, but also allows it in a way to be misappropriated as an image. Like this is why it came down. And to me, that was like sheer persecution of the building and the people. But then on the other side of it is something that falls out of regulation, the free university water basin. When the people attempted to liberate the space, they didn't realize, anyway, I don't mean to overinterpret anything, but this kind of quality of like trying to find spaces that supersede regulatory procedure and thereby are an opportunity, which is I think that is like such an incredibly, I mean, it's so potent 
I don't think real estate is often nearly as good at finding it as people like Patty Astor were with the Fun Gallery. Uh, right, I think it's all throughout your lecture, I was thinking of Terrain Vog and Solis Morales and the degree to which spaces that fall out of commodity process, mm -hmm. we shouldn't rush to put them in it <laughs> because they are indeed that. So, but, and one final comment, the airport, the Howard Hughes Airport at Playa Vista for Hughes Industries was a real contentious site that people wanted to get their hands on as real estate. And there was a huge push to like stop it from becoming overly commodified. Dana Cuff at UCLA back in the early 90s described that there was still an ethos in land in, in the perception of land use in the US, despite all the perversions of American media, that you should work to control property. And the public, by and large, does not believe most people who own or control property have exerted an ethical amount of work to control such property. So that when you object about the use of property, you get called a quack, that's her term, when in fact you're exposing a kind of broadly held belief that property is overly controlled by people who have not earned the right to control that property. That's where I think the Berlin, your project for the floating university is this kind of ingenious, well, it's not ingenious because you're not trying to be tricky, but it's, a, it's, it's very poignant that way. Like how to maintain authorship and control over a place without submitting yourself to the normal procedure of gaining economic authority to own it. Mm -hmm. There's something that's remarkable that way. Anyway, those are comments, not questions. It's a wonderful lecture. Thank you. And your jukebox method of suggesting topics <laughs> kind of worked. <laughs> Something so serious you could go against something lighter. Mm. Thank you. Maybe a uh, final uh, conversation. Maybe you can wrap it with the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a super fast question. Uh, first, uh, thank you for this amazing um, conversation and the presentation, of course. And also, uh, one, one of the things that I found like amazing and, and very meaningful uh, in the world of Raw Labor is how you explain, I mean, beyond the project, like all of the process after the project, or as you say, in, in some point, like the design futures. Um, so, but also you mentioned Donna Haraway and staying with the trouble. So I, I would like to ask you, um, you, you know, like more like a, as a comment, how, how do you envision like the new future of, you know, like of these kind of practices? As, I mean, I personally see like a very close relationship between Donna Hathaway and, and Ronald Labor, maybe. But I, I want to know like how you envision like these, uh, like questions that need to be responded on, like in, in, in this like emergency, let's say, in this urgency of, of new ideas. Mm. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the good thing about everything that I showed today is that um, it has already happened <laughs> and, uh, and I can look at it kind of retrospectively. Of course, there's, a, um, the, the, there's always um, a, the, to, to create kind of utopian ideas or, or even if it's only short term utopia in the next 10 years or something, there's always a big tr attraction in that. Um, but uh, but the, what we found out is that it's always very helpful to root this all in our presence. Somehow, you know, look at what, what is there and what we have at the moment to actually also make any kind of future vision um, understandable and, and uh, kind of graspable. And we, 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 we very barely think about futures that are further away than 10 years, I think. And, um, uh, but of course, we try to, that within these 10 years, we can imagine very, very drastic changes, like the changes that we've all went through in the past 
years. Now, who would have thought that uh, we would be all sitting at home uh, for a year? Uh, or, um, or I don't know if it's the same here, but you know, the energy crisis and the war in Ukraine uh, is really something that changes the, our world completely. It's kind of turning it upside down. And, um, and that's, of course, a, um, it's a disaster. Both uh, <laughs> is a disaster. But on the other side, it also shows us um, something that also we can see when we look at history, you know, especially in Germany. You know, the, the, the Third Reich was maybe 12 years, 13 years, no? And then it's not so, so much time uh, that you need to destroy a lot of things in the whole world, <laughs> if you want. Um, so, uh, but, but if you see it the other way around, that's also, there is the possibility of change. So, that, you know, we can, we can change our behavior towards nature. We can, be, we can change our behavior towards resources. We can, we can um, uh, also look at, um, look at architecture in a completely different way. That's, that's no pro pro problem. And we can create um, a practice that's maybe also a lot faster than the architecture that we know. Um, because that's, you know, with architecture, we're mostly stuck in these very slow processes. Except if you are, <laughs> we have, you know, if, if you're in one of these countries where things go super fast because there's a lot of investment into concrete uh, and uh, the political systems are, you know, and the um, planning authorities are not so strong, uh, then of course they uh, can go very fast. But uh, normally it's, uh, it's a slow ship and we can, uh, it's too slow for all the changes that need to be made. And um, yeah, that wasn't really an answer to your question, but it was a, somehow. This is a great place to leave it. Please continue. But thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.